This is a history of the video game console wars. A panel about video game consoles. And that's what this is. We're the foundation for the preservation of Gen 1 Pokemon. I'm Max. I'm Andrew. This is all the facts about the panel, so I guess we should just get started. Video game consoles started in about 1972. If someone's going to argue that a video game console existed before 1972, it didn't look like this. It looked like a goddamn room this size full of blinking lights. Because, yeah, you could play video games in the 60s, but you couldn't fucking do it at home, and that's what this panel is about, video game consoles at home. For, so for all intents and purposes, history begins in 1972, with the first generation of video game consoles. What made these consoles interesting was that they were fucking awful. As you can tell, the controllers were hardwired into the console. The consoles had to be plugged into the wall, but also had internal battery slots, so you could like put in a bunch of batteries so you could run this thing without plugging it into the wall. Uh, I think the real reason for that was mom and dad didn't want to have to move this CRT and entertainment console out of the way to plug in Pong. But the more fun answer is, I don't know, sometimes you might be out in the woods with the generator with only one power outlet, so you can plug the CRT in but still play Pong. Don't think anyone's done that. It sounds cool to me. These consoles also didn't actually have um, cartridge games. In this generation, basically, you, if you wanted the newest, latest game, you had to get the newest, latest console. You couldn't just go, oh, hopefully Persona 5 comes out for the Pong. No, you'd have to buy the Persona 5 console. The games were in black and white, and it had the graphical fidelity to render like three lines at a dot that could move. So like very little's going on. And first out of the gate, we had the Magnavox Odyssey. I need to tell you, I've already lied to you. The Magnavox Odyssey was a cartridge-based console in that it has a bunch of switches inside that flip when you plug the cartridge in that allows you to play different games, meaning it could play all of the games you wanted, but if you lost the cartridge, you wouldn't be able to play them anymore. Sucks to be you. You've been locked out. It's like buying a BMW and then them charging you for heated seats. This was developed by Ralph H. Baer. He also invented Simon, if you know what that is. I believe he also invented uh, Chuck E. Cheese, but don't fact check me on that. It's been too long since I last fact checked myself, but I'm going to keep saying it. It retailed for $99, which was uh, $566 in the money that existed when we last gave this panel, which was last year, right? So I don't know, like $5 million now, given how inflation has been going. And not only did the Odyssey come with the cartridges that let you, you know, flip the switches, you play different variations of Pong, because everything was just Pong back then. It also came with a Dollar Tree prize pack. Games back then couldn't do things like keep time, or track score, or tell you you've lost. So you had to use shit like this. Poker chips. Money. Some games came with overlays you put over your TV. Because if you're exploring a haunted house, but you can see all of the ghosts, it doesn't work out too well. Next up, we have more Odyssey clones. There were a lot of Aussie clones. Again, remember, if you wanted to make the newest, latest game, you had to make the newest, latest console. There was no other way. So these started introducing new things like scoring, sound, difficulty levels, not requiring dice. You know, stuff video games have. It took a while, but we got there. This isn't inherently chronological, but next up, we've got the Nintendo Color TV which, yes, was a color video game console in the first generation. Yes, I've lied to you again. Yes, we're probably going to keep lying to you. This is not an informative panel. Do not take anything we say seriously. Nintendo Color TV, it, it came in color. It could do up to four players, which was pretty cool. And it sold three million units in Japan, which is really good. The original Odyssey sold a third of a million units, which was considered groundbreaking at the time. And now those are considered Ouya numbers. Next up, we have the Coleco Telestar. There were a lot of Coleco Telestars. There were like 17. Coleco just produced Pong consoles. Like, um, what's the modern day equivalent? Like, Roblox produces DLC skins. I don't know if that's a Roblox thing. I've never played it. I have standards. <laughs> but uh, these were relatively cheap, premiering in as cheap as like. Premiering with prices as low as like $50 in back then money, which is about 210 in today money. Co Coleco had to just keep coming up with new ways to make the console interesting. So it went from this to whatever the fuck this is. <laughs> yeah. Coleco invented Grand Theft Auto back in the 70s. And if you're walking through the video game aisle in the 70s, you know where there's no internet to check what to get. And it's a new industry. And you see this and that, and all the other stuff we've shown you. At some point, you're going to get really confused and not know what to buy. 
Because when Timmy said he wanted Pong, this doesn't answer the question of which Pong Timmy wanted. And that led us to the first video game crash of 1977. It is not the most prevalent crash, but it definitely did a number on the industry and retooled it in a way that is honestly for the better. Because I don't think you guys would want to buy a console just to play Persona 5. Anyway, uh, this brings us to the second generation of video game consoles. This is called the Atari generation. Not because the Atari 26 was the most groundbreaking console, but because it was the only one any of you have heard of. In this generation, we got up to, you know, like, two-bit graphics or something, you know, revolutionary shit. Um, there were colors, there were, let's see what else, uh, games could run on cartridges for once. You had modular controllers, so you didn't have to, like, sit with the console in your lap while it overheated and burned your thighs like a coffee from McDonald's. And out the gate, of course, was the Fairchild Channel F. This was the uh, first cartridge-based console. It has controllers that look like they're mixed between a Wiimote and a flight simulator stick. I don't know, they just look weird, I'm gonna be honest. I don't, they didn't know what they were doing, which is clear because as the first cartridge-based console, it failed spectacularly. People were not ready for that technology in 1976. And uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of how it went. They were ready for it when uh, the ColecoVision and the Intellivision came out though. Just because they both have vision in the name doesn't mean they're owned by the same company. Coleco, despite destroying the video game market like two years ago, was like, let's get back in this shit. And in television, which was Hasbro, was like, oh, we should also do this. Because back then, everyone was like, yeah, let's make a video game console. That seems like a cool thing to do. Like, I don't know, dyeing your hair, cutting your bangs. Like, I'll just make a video game console. So first of all, if you look at the controllers, I don't know what they were smoking. It's like an old, it's like a flip phone keypad with a joystick. Because they didn't have D-pads yet. That was the thing Nintendo invented. <laughs> the Intellivision did come with a speech synthesizer because they tried to make Hey You Pikachu for it. But then realized Pokemon didn't exist. And let's be honest, it was probably better than the one the N64 came out with. Because even in the late 70s, they were like, hey, let's make a really unnecessary expansion slot. The ColecoVision, on the other hand, was really good at plagiarism. Uh, the best part about the ColecoVision was you could buy an add-on that allowed you to play Atari 2600 games. No way. <laughs> yes. And here's the thing about how video game console companies work. You normally sell the console at a loss and make up the difference in publishing fees. There are some consoles we're going to talk about later that didn't do that for some goddamn reason. If your plan is, I know, we'll move more consoles, which you sell at a loss, by including an Atari 2600 add-on which you're not getting direct money off of, to sell more Atari 2600 games, to give Atari more publishing fees. I don't know what your plan is, and you have failed. And they did. And next we have the Odyssey Square. And you need to be clear, this is real. Full, full QWERTY. Back then, people were like, well, is it a video game console? Is it a computer? Is it a talking dog? You know, whatever, man. These controllers were at the absolute worst. And then we have the Atari 2600, which is, is the one you know about. This thing outsold all the other consoles in this generation by a factor of four to one, meaning it was the single most dominant video game console to have ever been released. Uh, if you remember like the PS2 versus everyone else, that was not even three to one. Best selling console ever for, you know, the 80s in comparison to its other, I don't know why I'm using her really here. Basically, it could just play video games. It was good at it. This, start, this is when people started developing the concepts of video game genres. So we had our first RPG game, which was called Adventure, and our first adventure game, which was somehow not called Adventure, but called Pitfall. Atari Online. Even in the 80s, you could download video games over the phone. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah you, you, thought, you thought Xbox was ahead of the time? No. Atari beat them to it 20 years before that, and then Sega's gonna beat them to it 10 years later. Uh, it also was compatible with Sega Genesis controllers for some reason. That's how forward-thinking this console was. It outlasted every other Atari console except the Jaguar. And now we're on a generation three. We're, we got 8 bits. So this was starting to introduce, where games started looking more like things we recognize today as games. Um, so the first one out of the gate is, of course, the SG-1000 and the Atari 7800. Uh, so the SG-1000 didn't sell too well, so Sega just rebranded it everywhere they released, and it's known in America as the Master System. So, and then, of course, this is also the generation where Nintendo came out with the Nintendo Entertainment System. 
And then all of these consoles came out. Now, most people can't name any or haven't heard of any of these consoles. You've maybe heard of the Commodore 64 because of memes of how horrible it was. But this caused a huge problem in the video game industry. When you had this many bad consoles, it just caused another video game crash. Because people didn't know what consoles to buy, games weren't good, so the market shrank 97%. And if 97% of any market goes away, people aren't going to want to do that. But why did the video game market crash? Well, as I said, too many consoles. So stores could only hold so many consoles in their shelves. So, because they had to have a section for that console and its games. So they couldn't have like the entire store dedicated to 26 different consoles. So they might stock three or four, but and as a consumer, you go and you're like, which console do I buy? I don't know what's good. So it was kind of hard for stores to keep up with all this. And then secondary, we had horrible shovelware games like E.T. It was a really bad game where you, there weren't quality controls of games back then, so people were just trying to turn out as many games as they could as quickly as possible to make a quick buck. I think E.T. was made by one guy in six weeks. So, and the response from everyone was, we don't blame you. And the third reason for the game crash was there was competition with home computers. Home computers were currently in a price war, so the price was actually dipping down towards what a home console was. And they also could market themselves as, yes, you can play games on it, but you can also do other important things like your taxes, Word documents, and like... That's it, honestly, it was the 80s. Yeah, but it was still, it was competition. So all of these factors really kind of nearly killed the industry. Um, but luckily, Nintendo came out with a robot um, and saved the industry because they had some fantastic ideas. Um, they lit, first of all, the NES was just a fantastic console. It had quality games that really was something that people would rally around as being, oh, this is what I want. So stores could stock just this. Um, and they also introduced the idea of quality assurance and limiting developers to a certain number of games per year so that developers would actually spend time on the games before they released them. And that if they didn't have the Nintendo stamp, they wouldn't let them publish it. Next up, we have the fourth generation of video game consoles. Uh, this started in 1987, but this is a generation that you probably remember for the Super Nintendo, which came out in 1991. Yeah, a lot of stuff happened before the Super Nintendo came out in this generation. Like, the Genesis came out in 89. No one cared, but it came out then. So this is where we started seeing a slow transition to discs. Most stuff when it came out was still cartridge-based, but especially towards the tail end of this generation, you were seeing more disc-based consoles. Uh, we also started seeing a, trans a somewhat of a transition away from MS Paint, though, you know, like pixels and shit. But it's, this is a very transitory, it, it, this is like, you know, the Ivy Store to Gen 3's Bulbasaur and Gen 5's Venusaur. It's just that awkward, I don't know what I'm doing here. Uh, but we did start seeing the end of computer-based consoles because computers realized we probably shouldn't just be selling ourselves to be compatible for children because mom and dad don't, don't want the kid playing the computer all day. Which, I mean, <laughs> gestures vaguely. So here we, uh, here we have two competitors, the TurboGrafx-16 and the Neo Geo. Now, these were the first ones out the gate. Uh, TurboGrafx was developed by NEC and Hudson Soft. Uh, if you remember the name Hudson, they're the Bomberman people. So Bomberman had his own video game console for a while, and uh, true to form, it fucking bombed. It released, well, here's the thing. This thing actually outsold the Sega Genesis in Japan. But that, that's really all it did. It, 10 million units, over half of them were in Japan. The rest weren't anywhere. It was a good console, but just, you know, it was made in 1987 to, to just be a better NES, and not made in 1991 to be a direct competitor to the Super Nintendo. So it just kind of fell apart towards the end. Mm -hmm. Consoles that didn't fall apart towards the end because they were already doomed include the Neo Geo, which retailed for $700. In 1987, money. What? Yeah. <laughs> You're just losing your shit. Are they selling it out of box? Yes. I knew a guy that had a Neo Geo. So the Neo Geo was designed to play high quality ports of arcade titles. This thing kicked everything in its day. This was the Rolls Royce of home consoles, and you fucking paid for it. Look at that controller. 
Games could cost up to $200 and then in 1980s money. So next time you complain about the new, new Zelda being $70, remember that. Let's see what else? Uh, we have the Odyssey One Square, the most revolutionary console of the time. I realized it's been a while since we lied to you. We're still not lying to you. This is a real video game console. Uh, and then we have you know the two you actually know, the Super Nintendo and the Sega Genesis. This is really the only generation that Nintendo and Sega were in direct competition with each other. Uh, the NES absolutely blew the master system out of the water. We covered that in more detail in the Sonic and Unfortunate History panel, which was on Friday, so if you didn't see it, I don't know, Invented Time Machine, that's on you, man. The Super Nintendo sold 49 million units to Sega's 33. No notable expansions for the Super Nintendo were the Game Boy Player. If you didn't want to buy a Game Boy, you could get the Game Boy Player that would allow you to play Game Boy games because it was a it, it was an official Game Boy emulator. The, the whole Game Boy was in the player. It didn't utilize the Super Nintendo. It was really fun because you could like pause the game and draw mustaches. So like, if you want to play like Pokemon Red or Blue, but when Drowsy shows up, he has a mustache. That was a lot of fun. Uh, Sony definitely didn't develop the sound card for it and didn't also develop, almost develop a disc-based edition. I promise those things didn't happen. And that was in comparison to Sega, which was just this edgy and cool console, as you can tell by Nintendo being like all boxy and family friendly. And, and Sony's looking like it literally could skateboard in Sega. And the, the Sega Genesis had a lot of add-ons. Some of them were good ideas, like the CD. Some of them were not good ideas, like everything else. But what was fun in this generation was we finally started getting real functional handheld consoles. Before this, handheld video games were basically a Tiger Electronics basketball LCD screen. And now you have the Sega Game Gear, the Atari Lynx and the uh, Turbo Express. And you know what's good about all these consoles? Full color backlit screens. Every one of them. Some, like, Game Gear had a TV tutor. You could sit outside and watch the Discovery Channel if you wanted to. I don't know why you would, but it was an option. And collectively, these sold about 13 million units to this thing, which doesn't have full color or a backlit screen. So this thing, did what the other companies didn't, which was have a good battery life. Because when it comes down to it, the only thing that's important to a train commuter trying to play video games is the video game not dying halfway through the commute. And these were really good at dying halfway through the commute. They ate batteries. The Game Gear used six double A's and it lasted like four hours. Because again, backlit screen, full color. This thing, basically a rock with buttons. And it came with Tetris. So now we're on to Generation 5, which we have to remind you is not a Pokemon. Generation 5 is where we finally got the transition into 3D, not that weird gimmicky movie 3D or whatever Star Fox was doing. Um, and they start, instead of cartridges, we finally really solidified around optical discs. Uh, Nintendo just kind of went backwards on that and then decided to ignore everyone else. Um, and it was a gradual shift in the console market where Nintendo really gets dethroned. Sega finally starts to rot, and, um... Well, I, I would argue Sega was already rotting, it just became a lot more clear. So, the 3DO was the first console out of the game. It was typed on high heaven, it was Time's Magazine product of the year. Yeah! Advanced features. Like, costing they, $700. They outsourced manufacturing to other companies. As we said before, they usually, you usually normally sell consoles at a loss, but by outsourcing the console manufacturing, those companies making the console were only involved in the production of the console. Therefore, they're not going to sell it at a loss because they want to make money on this process. So it cost $700 and then money. So it was um, difficult to uh, justify the cost. And we, don't, we think it sold at least a million copies because that's how many copies of gas. I don't remember if you yeah, say this. So the, the other problem it had was uh, for multiple controllers, you had to daisy chain. So you had to plug controllers into other controllers. One other thing, uh, it was developed by the guy who ran EA. Which is, yeah, that explains a lot about what's going on. Because he's like, oh, I'll make a video game console that's perfect for me, a video game developer and publisher. And not for me, a video, yeah. It's, yeah, so it did It did have EA exclusivity for a while, though. And that's really what kept it going early on. Uh, and then we have the Atari check. It sold the cool 250,000 units. Um, which is worse than the Steam 3DO. Um, so it was also very backwards. It uses cartridge instead of CDs. 
They eventually added a CD add-on, but just made it look like a toy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the strategy of not releasing any games. Uh, this did wonders for it, just like the Wii U uh, does later. It was graphically superior to everything else at the time, but if you don't have games for it, nobody really cares. Also, you didn't have developers, it was just hard to program for, so a lot of the games were just ports to it. So they were cheap ports, so they honestly ran worse than the systems on the other consoles, so it just looked worse, ran poorly, so why would you pay more for it? To, to be clear, it had five CPUs. Two of which told what the other three do. One of the CPUs was the same CPU that powered the Genesis and the Super Nintendo. So the ports used only that CPU. But that CPU couldn't actually function in the way they did for the Genesis and the Super Nintendo, which is why the games were worse, despite the console being better. Yeah, and when Sony came out with their console at a lot cheaper value than just being better, it threatened to sue Sony for price dumping just because Sony was selling cheaper than they were. All right, and then next we have uh, Sega. So first they released the 30QX, uh, which was an add-on for the Genesis, um, which sold quite well on like day one, and then sales completely stopped because by the time it was released in the US, the Sega Jaguar was already released in Japan and on the horizon to come out in the United States in six months. In the, the Saturn. Saturn, yes. yeah. Um, so they're both so awful, we confuse them. <laughs> so, yeah, so it was basically a 32-bit stopgap, but you, they didn't need that because the 64-bit console was a year out. And the Saturn was also a surprise launch, um, mm -hmm. where they just trying to get extra market share, but they didn't communicate this to their vendors, they didn't communicate this to their developers, so they launched, and the first party games were ready, but all the sub-developers were like, you told us we had six more months. We don't have a game yet. So the game console came out, and there were zero games on the horizon for the next at least six months. Very reminiscent of Gen 1. <laughs> yeah. So the Saturn also had two discrete CPUs, which used quadrilaterals instead of triangles. It was sold at $400 back then, which was pretty expensive. Um, but it was basically slapped dash together after seeing what the PlayStation did. So Sega kind of Sega the whole thing. And, uh, did what they did for Sonic the next few generations. Also, the controller, who looks the whole home of Pac Man? What? It's so ugly. All right, and then we have Nintendo. So it was the most powerful hardware of the generation, and it was funnily enough that came around after Sega snubbed the Project Reality people who were the ones building this hardware. Um, they, they were going to originally work with Sega through Tom Clancy. But Sega said, you're not a Japanese company, we're not going to work with these guys. So Tom Glancy sent the Nintendo, and we got the Nintendo 64. Um, it had the most beef, which was, this was the last time Nintendo had to be for the console generation. Um, but unfortunately, it was held back by the idea to use cartridges instead of CDs. So it had quick load times, but it had very poor storage limits. So games had to be a lot smaller or a lot smartly made, which was something that was a lot harder to developers, so developers did want. But, but it was mostly carried by the first-party <coughs> games of the generation, because Nintendo came out with fantastic first-party games in this generation, like Nintendo 64, or uh, sorry, Super Mario 64 and such. Um, but if you think about it, there weren't really third-party games for the N64 that were made. Also, the controller was very awkward, designed for someone who had three to four hands. Um, <laughs> not sure. Uh, though on the plus side, it was still getting games to this day. <laughs> All right, and then we had the Sony PlayStation, which basically just didn't do other dumb things. And that's what the competition was um, They put their games out on CD, this is a fucking like, unlike Nintendo. It had straightforward hardware, it was oh, easy to program for, unlike Sega. And it never retailed for $700 like the 3DO. Uh, so they actively reached out to the third-party developers to make development as easy and cheap as possible. So people liked working with Sony, so they made a lot of games. So Sony PlayStation had a fantastic third-party <laughs> library. Um, funny enough, for the development of this started after they got snubbed by Nintendo on a, sound, uh, on a deal on a console they were going to go together. So Sony was like, well, fuck you guys, we're going to make our own console. And then they came out with the Sega Dreamcast, which is kind of in a weird transition state because it was kind of between Generation 5 Generation 6. It didn't really fit very well in either of them, which was why Sega died at this point in the console generation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this was the first generation where cross-platform titles really became a thing. Uh, computer games also started coming back in as kind of 
gaming systems now, so you started getting competition from there. And games from there that you could be played on all of them, but computer had their own games like StarCraft, Age of Empires, Rogue <coughs> that really did port to consoles very well. Like we had StarCraft 64, but that that wasn't an RTS. Like you couldn't do RTSs or top-down games like that on consoles. This also marked America's return to the console market with the Xbox, because they had been out for several years, and it was kind of a Japan-only market since the, the tens, since Nintendo came with the, the NES, which is when the market shifted to Japan. Um, this is also where we first really got online multiplayer again after the Atari Online. Consoles began serving more general home entertainment needs than specialized gaming systems. Also, two joysticks. We still have that today, so that was obviously a good idea. First, we had the Sony PlayStation 2, which was a fantastic console and outsold all of the competition in this generation. No but, clapping. But why? Of the three we looked at, this is the graphically worst console. <laughs> it's because the PlayStation 2 marketed itself as a DVD player, which most people didn't have at the time, and they were priced about the same as a DVD player. Mm. So when parents would go to the store to get a DVD player, they'd be like, well, we could get this regular DVD player that just plays DVDs, or we could get a PS2, and then little Timmy can have something to enjoy at the same time we have our DVD player, which in turn helped sell more DVDs, <laughs> which then helped more people get into the DVD player market. It was a nice feedback loop that really helped this PlayStation just take off. It helped them out sell their competition about three to one. Um, Damn. It did a great job, because cool parents got your kids this. If your parents weren't cool, you've got a Nintendo game people like me, or if your parents were horrible, you got a Dreamcast. And then we had the handouts for this generation, which continued to see Nintendo yeah, absolutely dominate this market with no questions asked. Yeah, Nintendo had basically zero competition in the big handheld market. They just dominated. Everyone else who tried just put some piece of junk garbage in. Nobody cared about it. So now we're at the seventh generation of video game consoles. Um, at this point, it kind of was cementing into you know, Nintendo, Sony. Microsoft. Uh, before the time, mean, we saw the old generations. This is like the Wild West, and now like our competition is out of this VCR with some remotes. <laughs> so people are doing, and I don't understand why. I think I think a DVD. I think a company making DVD players that were good at playing specifically mini games on DVDs could have gone somewhere, and it didn't. So first we have the Xbox 360 and the PS3. Um, the 360 was slightly outsold by the PlayStation 3, primarily because uh, Japan would never buy an American-made console. Really, that's why it out. Like, the PS3 outsold the Xbox 10 to 1 in Japan. They both tried to copy the, the success of the PlayStation 2. So, Sony tied itself to Blu-ray format, Xbox in a more haphazard uh, attempt tied itself to the HD DVD format. And honestly, the confusion between which format we should adapt to let us all just go, fuck it, we'll keep buying DVDs, which is really good, honestly. Blu-rays are so expensive. Why do you need them? Uh, they both sold 80 million units. Uh, the Xbox 360 was far ahead of the Sony PlayStation early on, so it was getting like the core gamer demographics. So then they decided, hey, what if we could also be a Nintendo Wii? So like the second half of the 360 lifespan was like the Kinect and other weird bullshit. Which lets Sony be like, oh, we'll just cater hardcore gamers, and then Xbox was left without a, without a fan base going into the next generation while Sony had kind of won back everybody who was frustrated with them for releasing a $600 video game console. Uh, then we, of course, have the Nintendo Wii. This outsold the PS3 and the 360, but not by as much as, like, at least in the time we thought, because after two years, no one cared about the Wii anymore. <laughs> it was just a shovelware simulator. Then, of course, in the handhelds, we have the DS and the PSP. Since the handhelds started a little earlier than the consoles, Sony had a huge like financial advantage over Nintendo going in and a lot of momentum. So like, oh, we'll release the PSP to compete directly with Nintendo. And Sony's best shot is only getting outsold two to one. Uh, the PSP did everything that Nintendo, which was being graphically superior and having a specific disc format so you could watch movies on it in case, you know, you wanted to watch Kill Bill on that screen. <laughs> no one does. And uh, because of that, it didn't have a good battery life, so it got beaten by a DS, which, let's be honest, was the most gimmicky bullshit I've ever seen at the time. Right. And we have Generation 8. Um, we're still, we, we, we're now installing Generation 9, but the Generation lines are starting to become more blurred. 
Because we, we do get these generation gaps, but they try to extend them more and more. Um, and if you like the sales numbers, we're not great for anyone that wasn't PlayStation. Because as Max said, PlayStation really got that audience back. Xbox didn't have it, and the Wii U had the fantastic tragedy of not releasing games, so they cratered in this generation. Yeah, so, and then we have, of course, the handheld market, um, which is going about the same. Sony not doing so well. Nintendo is still rocking it. They were both losers in this generation because folks are. <laughs> oh my god. Is there a Wii for the Wii U? No, no, no. It's not worth a slide. It's the Wii U. Yeah, it's so the Wii U. We're all Wii U. Yeah, but both were the, were the winners of the handheld market now because they're, they were easy, everyone has them, you don't have to sell specific hardware for it. So the, the kind of handheld generation kind of is phasing out, especially now that Nintendo has completely cannibalized their handheld line with the new hardware or their console, or physical console. Probably because they had such a early advantage in the time frame because they were out for yeah, a we're, we're almost out, so. Yeah. No, 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 it's 45, so you, you don't have five minutes. So, uh, you yeah, know, there's some other stuff. There were classic video game consoles, then they stopped making those, which was dumb, because those were cool. You can follow us on Twitter at 5th Gen Not PKMN, on YouTube at 5th Gen Is Not Pokemon, and we have a Discord, and that is the link, and I was too lazy to make a QR code, so do, do whatever you want, man. If you want, have any questions for us, feel free to stop us since we're heading outside of the hall. We can't do about video game consoles. And the VR. But thank you for coming. Woo!